Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's program has been brought to you by Fairway Market, like no other market a New York City institution that sells the best local, national, and international artisan foods for prices that can't be beat. For more information, visit fairwaymarket.com. Broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn, you're listening to heritageradionetwork.org. This is Dorothy Can Hamilton, and you're listening to Chef Story on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. And today, my chef guest is not only a chef; he's a great friend of mine, and he's probably one of the most delicious people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not the only one to think that. Um, Food and Wine Magazine has called him one of the 2009 Best New Chefs. Modern Bride Magazine has called him the King of Cakes. He has countless gold medals and certificates of honor in culinary competitions. Get this. The New York Times termed his bakery the Manola Blahnik of wedding cakes. Wow. Uh, Zagat calls him wedding cake master. Great Performances calls him the Cartier of the pastry chef. And guess what? He actually gets paid by modern bride, town and country, Martha Stewart weddings in style, the New York Times, to make these unbelievable wedding cakes. It is none other than I am so happy to welcome here today Ron Ben Israel, the famous Ron Ben Israel, and maybe you know him as the sweet genius on TV Food Network. <laughs> so, welcome, Ron. Nice to be here, Dorothy, at the oh. heart of Bushwick. In the Brooklyn. heart of Don't you just love it? I it's feel, a, even though I grew up in Israel in the Middle East, yeah. coming to Bushwick feels getting to my roots. Oh my gosh. Well, it, you know, you did say it was a bit like a, an Israeli restaurant in here. Right. And I mean, the way they kept on adding parts of the restaurant and right. it feels half improvised and half well thought. Oh, and, and delicious. It's a delicious restaurant. But anyway, let's get back to Israel here. So this mm-hmm. is where you grew up, right? We were. I grew up. Wait, you were born and raised in Israel. Yes, my parents came from Europe after the war. Uh-huh. And it was, I guess, a new country there. And I was the first born. And there was a lot on my shoulders to grow up and be a strong soldier. But so you, I was. You went in the military. Yes, but before that, I was making little cakes in the sandbox. <laughs> And when people ask me, how did you get into cakes in New York? I made up this story. It is a story that the older kids crushed my little cakes, mud cakes. And I said, I will show them. I'll go to New York and have a bakery. (laughs) But that's not a true story (laughs) at all. (laughs) I was going to say, you probably, um, I was never good at building sandcastles or anything like that. But um, that's the first time a mud cake or a sand. Oh, I have Cake lots of three. stories that half of them I invented and then I start believing them. Okay, well, let's get to the real ones, Ron. Okay. The real one was... Well, when, so you were... Wait a minute, let me get back yeah. there. So you were born in Israel. Uh, you uh, uh, In Israel, you were in the military, but mm-hmm. also you were a ballet dancer. 
ballet, not Billy, ballet <laughs> dancer. <laughs> I was actually a modern dancer and ballet trained. Oh, ballet trained yeah. in a modern dance. Oh, so yeah. tell us about that. Was that in Israel? Yes, but I actually always did folk dancing as a teenager. And I loved performing with troops and doing this horror thing, barefoot and very natural. And I also went to art school. Uh -huh. While I was in the Israeli army, a friend from art school said, I started taking modern dance classes and ballet. You should come and see. So I came in my army uniforms. I had a night off. And I saw the little girls wearing pink tutus holding the bar and the piano music. And I was hooked just by looking at it. I immediately wanted to do it. And I started taking classes sporadically. Mm -hmm. And just, I mean, it took the discipline appealed to me so much. It is disciplined. What was harder, the ballet school or the military? Ballet school, no question. Really? What, the army is easy. They just tell you what to do. Uh -huh. And you say, yes, yeah. yes, officer. And you do it. And the army is about being in a position. There's always somebody below you, somebody above you. Ballet is all about you being the instrument and honing the body to perform a vision of a choreographer. And it's an impossible task. It's you know, you, the more you work, the more experience you get, but you grow older and the body gets injured. Okay, so uh, what ages were you uh, doing dance? So I started off and on, you know, very sporadically during the army years, which were 18 to 21. Uh -huh. And the moment I got discharged... I enrolled in a school and started auditioning, and I was half-baked, that's the truth. <laughs> But I was strong and, and flexible, so I cheated my way. What, and so how long did you dance for? Totally, I was active for 15 years. 15 years? Uh, yes, uh, isn't it funny? Ah, and it, and it, all, the whole time in Israel? Or did no, you? most of the time was in Israel. I, I was a bit different. Com I started as an apprentice, just mm -hmm. like we do in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. School, apprenticeship then junior position. Mm -hmm. But the main company that I worked for for years was called By Bat Door, which means contemporary. Mm -hmm. And our training was ballet, mm -hmm. and the style was uh, modern dance. And we had great choreographers come, Alvin Ailey, Paul Taylor. Wow. We had an amazing repertoire. And the producer of the company was Betsy B. de Rothschild. She was a baroness. And Ooh. unfortunately, she was a great philanthropist and an art lover. And she did pass away a few years ago, and the company mm -hmm. was disbanded. Oh. But so how yeah. so how did you g move into c cakes? cakes? I mean, I can see the <laughs> spectacle now, the wedding cakes that you do, and your sense of drama. I, now uh, you know we were dancing background, but where did the bridge come? It was a transition of few years. Uh, on one hand, I was crushed because I had knee surgeries and injuries and I was growing. I was 36 when I had to stop dancing. And, uh, you know, I had to find ways to support myself. And I already came to New York on and off, on and off. And I just knew that New York could be a home for me. Mm -hmm. So I did many, many different things. I learned to cook and bake for my mom mm -hmm. and all the aunts and uncles and the, the food culture that I grew up with. I knew I could bake cakes. Mm -hmm. So once again, I cheated my way into baking. I, mostly, I wasn't very good at restaurants. Mm -hmm. I worked for caterers and bakeries, mm -hmm. just baking. Mm -hmm. and so with no formal training? No formal training, but I always loved the discipline. Mm -hmm. So I would practice again and again and again. And you only have to show me once, and mm -hmm. I'll do it 15 times until it's perfect. I see. And yeah. I'm very obsessed, mm -hmm. if you haven't noticed. <laughs> I wasn't going to mention it. <laughs> <laughs> you learn, as a dancer, you learn basically to get the information and then practice. Mm -hmm. And that's why the kitchen always felt comfortable. And what a lot of different things happened. I did dozens of different jobs, all the jobs. And one in, of it, in pastry? No, not necessarily. No. Okay, what other kinds of jobs I did you do? I was working as a window designer, window decorator. Oh, really? For a colleague of mine who, that was his profession. All part-time, all, always trying to f find a living in New York City. Yeah, well, you studied design, didn't you? I studied art school, yeah, yeah fine arts. Yeah. And one of the jobs, he asked me to decorate some cakes. Oh, Real cakes? Uh, no, they were display cakes okay, uh -huh. for the pearl store on Fifth Avenue called Mi Mi Mickey Motto. Oh. So there were the pearls in the window and little cakes that I decorated. And lo and behold, to my surprise, people would 
enter this luxury Japanese pearl store and ask about the cakes. And that gave me the idea that maybe I can explore that. Ah. So one of the people who found about those cakes, and way before I had a business, was Martha Stewart. And she, she was starting a wedding magazine, and she called me in person. After seeing the, uh, the, the cakes pearl cake? She says, hi, this is Martha Stewart. And I said, sure. <laughs> sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> Darling. <laughs> but I came and we had breakfast. And she told me about the visions for the magazine. And she commissioned some cakes. Oh. And Did she know you could bake? Well, she saw I brought, I always bring something uh-huh. to, to uh-huh. eat. That's the catch. Uh-huh. Because when I looked at wedding cakes when I started, mm-hmm. I was thrilled by the techniques that mm-hmm. were unbeknownst to me then mm-hmm. but I hated the coloring everything was peachy I mean mm-hmm. this was late 80s early 90s everything was very shoulder pads on wedding dresses <laughs> <laughs> um, so and then the flavor I couldn't believe how Bland. how will I well you said it yeah so I started bringing old recipes and experimenting them mm-hmm. but it was great to be sought after and other magazines follow suit and people started ordering my cakes but i needed so to you yeah. hadn't sold you didn't have a company before no. martha stewart called you and when after she called you and put you in the magazine then people started calling people saying, started calling that's true my gosh so how did wait a minute we've missed how did you learn to do all of this and you're you know if you've not seen a ron ben israel cake they they look uh, unreal, because they're the flowers. I saw one cake you did as a peony. It looked just like a peony. <laughs> it was uh, it was sensational. I, they, I've never seen anything quite like it. So these th- things have a very real um, personality in them. You know, it looks like real flowers on them or pearls or whatever you're going to decide to do. They're huge. They can be huge or they can be <laughs> small. And uh, I've never seen anything like them. How did you teach yourself to do that? <laughs> well, I have to think how it happened. I'll tell you. But also, people, our listeners, your listeners, can see the work by going to weddingcakes.com. Okay. Which okay. shows you how long I've been doing it over 15 years because the, the internet.com names were available. Wow. Weddingcakes.com was available. That was a gift from a friend. He said, There's no way you can register Ron, Ben, Israel.com. Nobody will know who you are. So he gave me weddingcakes.com. Okay, cool. well, go, go Not there. for if you, sale. If, while you're listening, if you're at the computer, please go to weddingcakes.com mm-hmm. because they're magnificent pieces. Well, I'll tell you what happened. The moment people started, started ordering, I knew that I had to be trained. And there was nowhere to go. Uh, there were classes here and there that I found, but they were not satisfactory. And the French Culinary Institute at that time did not have any cake decorating. That oh. came a little bit later. Okay, full disclaimer now. Ron is a master visiting instructor for us, and now we have a full-blown cake course. But uh, anyway. Yeah. So I was seeking somebody to mentor me. Mm-hmm. And I found a person, a wonderful woman by the name of Betty Van Ostrand, who hails from Poughkeepsie, New York. And she won all the gold medals for the American Olympic team in the Food Olympics for years. Oh. And she was very well known in this industry and trained by now thousands of people. And I begged her with a piece of cake that I offered her to teach me. And I would travel to Poughkeepsie and sit with her over the weekends. And every time I got an order, I would call and say, I just sold a cake with Cattleya orchids. And she said, no problem. I'll teach you during the week. It will be ready for the weekend. Oh, so she's the one who taught They're called gum paste flowers. Uh, Actually, I changed the name. You did. Uh, Gum paste does not sound attractive to me. The origin of the name uh, in Europe, for instance, is sugar paste. Ah, that sounds And popular. that's how we call it. Right. So it's made out, the, the dough is made out of confectionery sugar. Uh, and you use it a little bit like porcelain. And, okay, explain. Porcelain is um, a bone, the, right? Right. But that dough will dry hard. We roll petals very thinly and shape them with tools and our fingers. And each petal is shaped by hand. And then the flour will dry in room temperature to be very brittle, 
and fine. Uh -huh. That's why I think it looks like China. And of course, the decorations are all edible. It's important for me that the cake will not have plastic columns. Everything that was very old-fashioned, in that respect, I wanted to eliminate. Okay, well, we're going to get into the <laughs> techniques a little later. But let's get back to, so you started getting orders. Uh, you decided that you needed some formal training. You mm -hmm. found Betty Van Nostrand up in Poughkeepsie. Mm -hmm. You went up there. Were you doing this in your apartment? I couldn't. I lived in a six-floor Walk up, up <laughs> studio <laughs> and uh, the, just my oven the cake yeah, down, with right? a toaster oven. No, I already knew because I always felt comfortable around professionals in the industry. And I guess I have the natural gift of gab mm -hmm. <laughs> and networking. Um, that's why I like the school environment so much because you learn more than you learn in the classroom sometimes. You learn in the corridors by meeting people and by tasting. Mm -hmm. So I had a chain of caterers over time that allowed me to use the kitchen late at night. Mm. I would usually start baking at 11 o'clock at night and I would go until 6 in the morning. And then I needed a place. These were commercial kitchens that I rented for. Were you working alone? Absolutely, all by myself. I didn't know any other way and I didn't know what I know. And what I, I needed to be safe, to fail, that nobody will see. Uh -huh. And it, I was figuring it out. And I needed a place to meet people, to meet the clients. So Maury Rubin, the owner of City Bakery, uh, who I met through other chefs, and he said, you know, you can meet the clients in my bakery. We'll sit them down with a cup of coffee and you will arrive and meet them, which was so generous. Wow. How, I, I, just, I just can't <laughs> believe this. It's from designing windows that you got to sit down with Martha Stewart and then uh, sort of through... Well, perseverance and intelligence, you've taught yourself to make probably the, the, the most spectacular wedding cakes available mm. on the planet. <laughs> and uh, with in New York City, such a hard city, they kind of opened their hearts to you and had, you know, Murray Rubin at City Bakery giving you your office. Well, I gave him a piece of cake, so he was sold. <laughs> oh, that piece of cake works every time. Okay, well, wait, we're going to take a little break here and we'll come back and I'm going to talk to you more about these cakes. Hi, I'm Steve Jenkins from Fairway Markets. I've devoted my idiot career to the old ways, the old recipes, the old tools, the old geography of where serious foods come from for centuries. And I've strived to make these wonderful things available to New Yorkers for 37 years. So it's a fait accompli for us to support Heritage Radio Network. And I hope you will too, and I hope you'll keep tuning in. For more information, please visit fairwaymarket.com. Well, welcome back. This is Dorothy Can Hamilton, uh, Chef Story. And today I'm interviewing the sweet genius, <laughs> Ron Ben Israel, and we're talking about his stupendous wedding cakes and how he got it started. Well, Ron, we, we left off with the unbelievable story of you working on your own and serendipitously really putting this whole company together. Um, let's get into the... Let's get into the techniques of making a cake. I think a lot of people out there think, I'm a great baker, and you know I, I'm following this, and I can decorate quite well, and I can do this. Uh, and the reality of doing these cakes is uh, like doing calculus to me. I mean, <laughs> explain how long it takes to make a wedding cake for 100 people, uh, let's say three or four tier cake. What mm -hmm. goes into it? Mm -hmm. I'd love to, with the caveat that what we do today, I wasn't able to do years ago. Okay, well, tell us what you do today. Right. Well, first of all, of course, one has to work from a licensed commercial kitchen. And I build a kitchen, and I'm looking forward to building a new one next year, that was built from scratch to serve our cakes. So it's very different from a regular pastry kitchen. We have special refrigeration, and... The point is not just to do one cake once in a while. I have to do it every week, every day, and guarantee to people who get married 
that in half a year the cake will be there fresh, which means everything has to be double. We need to have two walk-in refrigerators. But I don't understand. Well, one will break down in the middle of August when <laughs> all the orders are in. <laughs> I can't just have one oven because if it needs servicing, how will I bake? And that's something I learned. And owning a business and committing to serve people's special occasion is a big order. Somehow it was miraculous that nothing wrong happened in the beginning. But as I continued, I realized that I always need to have a backup. Mm -hmm. Cakes, good cakes, mean butter, eggs, good chocolate, things that are perishable. I can't just have, in the middle of the summer, one air conditioning unit in the window like I started. So I ended up investing whatever money I was making back into the business. Mm -hmm. And now I know that we can do a cake for 300 two cakes for 50 do a job for TV, and go and teach in school in one week and be okay. So the staying, staying power is what I'm grateful for. Figuring out how to do the cakes was exciting, but staying in business through ups and downs, that's where the real discipline comes. So that's a business, more uh, a business analysis. But let's get back to the technique of the cake. Oh. So tell me, how big are the pans? How many for, for a cake for 100 people? Mm -hmm. How many eggs go into it? Mm. Um, do you, is it just like cooking at home a cake? Or do but you Dorothy, I no longer know how many eggs because I've, my head chef has graduated from the culinary uh, center uh, six years ago. He's been with me for six years and I turn over. One thing is I turn over a lot of the tasks so I can continue. So I no longer, I have to admit, I no longer know no, exactly. how many eggs go into a cake. But uh, I still design the uh -huh. cakes and I sit with the clients. But when I tell Jeffrey Jenkins, our head chef, that this uh -huh. cake is coming, he right. already has people underneath him that break the eggs. I see. Everybody's moving up. Okay, so how many days in advance? Let's okay. say I'm getting married that on Saturday. What's the steps to making right. the cake? First of all, we have to, of course, meet the clients, submit designs, and be in touch with every participating vendor, the florist, the stationery, the chef who serves the meal, so we can design a cake that will be all-encompassing. So it, it works with the design. Right, yeah. that's where and I the love it. Yeah, right. okay. Once we got the order paid in advance because there's no way to start unless we have a deposit uh, the baking process cannot take place much earlier than a day or two because the cake needs to be fresh mm -hmm. but while the cake is baking we already worked beginning the week before on all the decorations because they actually need time mm -hmm. so it is a little bit like a military operation mm -hmm. my carpenter gets the order for the circles that will support each tier Ah. My artisans get the order to start with flowers and decorations. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I work underneath them. My production manager, <laughs> Jason Schreiber, who graduated four years ago. From the International of Culinary course, Center. Of yeah. course. Uh, I, pick, I pick up the creme, the creme de la creme that yeah. pops up. These yeah. were all my students. Yeah. And I yeah. met them in class. And they yeah. went to internship. Then they became employees. And they are the backbone of the business. Uh -huh. So Jason is the production manager. So he divides the task and he writes in my desk what I need to do because I specialize in certain flowers and decorations. And then we have the administrator of the overall business who schedules the van deliveries and packaging and so forth. So it's a very intense process that physically cannot take place more than a day or two before the event. So while the buttercream is being whipped and the cake is uh, mixed and baked, then the artisans work on parts, and then we all come together. And some complex cakes will have seven people working at the same time. Because to cover a cake with all the decorations will take hours for a single person. Mm -hmm. So we need to sit on those large tables that we build that six people can sit around, and the lazy Susan turns the cake, and we all work on it. At the same time. And I believe that with a group effort, we can make much better cakes than I started by myself. Because, because they're can, done more quickly? Yes, and every person has a speciality. So one person has much stable hands than me, Sarah Dengel, because she was a fine artist. So she can paint gold leaf on the cake without moving out of the line. I can't do it with the amount of coffee I drink. 
<laughs> I'm more of a sculpture. Uh-huh. So she will do the painting, and then somebody else will do the cutting with an exacto knife. Mm-hmm. So you see, so it all comes together, and I'm like a choreographer uh-huh. or a military officer. I have uh, to... A bit of both. Yes. Uh-huh. So the truth is, all those tasks that will take many, many hours by themselves come together. Mm-hmm. And I'm not the kind of business owner that knows how much each item, each cake costs to me to produce. I know to evaluate how long it will take, how many people will be involved, and then I set a price, and it's a flat price, and then we'll do our best, and there's always some enough to flow the business. <laughs> But since each cake is different, it's all... It's a little mystery how it all comes together. It doesn't sound like it's a business that you could put on a factory line. Mm. Your cakes are artisanal. They're each handmade. What was the most challenging cake you had to do? Oh, that's easy. It wasn't a wedding cake. It was a 100th birthday of a landmark of the Plaza Hotel. In 2007, the hotel turned 100. And the new owners gave a party basically for New York citizens. So there were over thousands of people, and the challenge was to work with the restorers and, and the architects to build a model of the Plaza Hotel, which is so iconic, exactly in scale. So the cake was 12 feet tall and 8 feet wide, and it was a huge cube shape, and it was structured under a tent in front of the hotel, and then they unveiled the tent, and we served the cake. How did you bake it? <laughs> <laughs> the they were the interesting thing the cake was all edible but w- it was went through many many stages of design and I had to talk to architects and it was fascinating first of all I hired everybody that ever worked for me and moved on to have their own companies or moved out of town to come back we had 17 people so it was like a reunion we had teachers from the school come and help it, it was just amazing and we had a very nice budget 2007 Yes, that, that. <laughs> I could pay well to everyone. And right. also, there was a challenge. Beside the order, Martha Stewart, who came in the beginning of the show, decided to make a documentary film about oh my a segment, a very long segment. So I knew that I couldn't cheat because if the building had 27 balconettes, she's going to have somebody counting them. Oh my God. And she did. <laughs> so we had to really, really be true to the scale. So I learned about making sets. So it was 12 feet high. Yes. So uh, how, did, uh, how long did it take? Uh, when Preparation thinking-wise. Yeah. Cerebral thinking and sketching one month. Then we built the walls and the balconies. Everything was made out of sugar that dried hard. And the building was really a shell like a um, gingerbread house. Ah. That was the final version. So the Plaza Hotel has a courtyard inside, mm-hmm. and basically the building is built around it. So we did all the walls, and they were empty inside. And then the base of the cake, all the sidewalks, 58th Street, 59th, 5th Avenue, they were cake. So there, that way we could slice the cake in front of the guests ah, without dismantling okay. the whole thing. The whole thing. So, and it was sugar paste um, yes. walls? Yes, yes. And hundreds and hundreds of windows and items. But all these became keepsake. Oh, so, so you could take a window home or a lamppost. And what was the hardest um, aspect of the hotel? To The hardest make? part... Technically, it was difficult, but uh, the hardest thing was faith. And what I said to my crew is, we'll do it, and we'll do the best we can, but if we go down, it will be in a burst of glory, because <laughs> you could not fail on a larger scale. If somebody wanted to see this documentary, do you know how they could see it? Uh, they can see it on our website, weddingcakes.com. Oh, weddingcakes.com, yeah. we're there. Right. There's media section, and I got permission to post the video. It's about nine minutes, and it shows the process. Uh-huh. And... The reason I mention faith and so forth is because it's always scary. No matter what level you are, there's a risk. Mm -hmm. And things in business never stay the same. So to be able to take this and say, yes, I have a good chance of succeeding, but not knowing 100% that it will succeed is a driving force. Mm -hmm. So there's always an edge to what we do because not two cakes I like. 
That's right. And you've got to uh, believe in yourself. So how large a staff do you, do you have right now? We are down in what we were in 2007. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the recession have affected greatly the industry of throwing parties. Mm -hmm. So we have six people full time mm -hmm. and we always have two interns from the school. Mm -hmm. So I rely on the very eight coveted positions. I will tell you that mm, it's easier to become a model for Ford. <laughs> yes, than to be an intern for Ron. Benedict. But you can't blame me. I have such no. a great pool. Yes, of people, and we, we tr they have to trail. They have to get a good recommendation from the chef instructor. Yeah, and they need to have a portfolio. Mm -hmm. But it's not always about the person who's fully formed mm -hmm. or the person who wants it the most. Because mm -hmm. just having um, desire. The, the desire is not enough. Mm -hmm. I look for people who can learn mm -hmm. and looking for the long term. And we had to adjust our business to the reality of the recession. We and still have the same amount of orders, but parties are smaller. Well, okay. So. We're, we're, we're <laughs> Let me ask you what other types of cakes you do other than wedding cakes. Um. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who get married order the baby cakes from us. Oh, they have baby cakes. All well, right. we put something in the wedding cake that guarantees. <laughs> <laughs> Repeat business, we call it. I think you're going to have a lot of people asking for those cakes after today. <laughs> um, Anniversary cakes, birthday cakes, really any type of celebration is appropriate. Now we do a lot of same-sex marriages in New York State. Which is, is are fun. those cakes different? Yes. How so? Well, you know, I thought it would be great, given I'm gay, all the gay couples will come to me, it will be heaven. Yeah. Not so. Because when two guys come together, they don't want necessarily the romantic cake they saw in my portfolio. They want something based on them. But we don't have traditions of gay weddings, so we have to start from scratch. Uh, and the so uh, how, how is the cake different? Do you have pictures of this on your website? Mm -hmm. oh. We're starting, and definitely on our Facebook page, Mm -hmm. uh, just in Facebook, if you search for on Ben Israel Cakes, we try to post a lot of the new designs to whet the appetite. Uh -huh. So a lot of cakes inspired by modern art. Uh -huh. And I renewed my membership to MoMA just because of that. And design. So tell, uh, tell us about the gay wedding cake. How is, mm -hmm. that, how is it different? Well, the donors, two men don't necessarily want a very floral cake. Mm -hmm. They want something that will be uh, reserved Mm -hmm. and not so colorful. So we do many more monochrom monochromatic cakes, grays, black and white. Very black and white cakes? Black and white cakes. From oh, very like a chic. tuxedo. Yes, or piano keys. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. um, never polka dots for two men, but no. stripes and mm -hmm. squares, mm -hmm. sort of sharp. We would play with monograms, with the names. Mm -hmm. Sometimes numbers will become a graphic element. Mm -hmm. uh, the cakes are three-dimensional, but a lot of surface details that will be two-dimensional, more like um, stationary mm -hmm. or wallpaper mm -hmm. and periods in art. We had two women who are both art dealers. Mm -hmm. So they actually commissioned a cake that would be Rococo. Oh, the cake really? was light robin blue. Mm. And then had silver decorations, but we worked with books and books and books because you can imagine making a cake for two art dealers. Ah. So it's not that the cakes are not romantic, but the couples are striving for a message. Mm -hmm. And since there's no tradition, they don't want what was done before. Right. So it's very challenging, Yeah. but exciting. Okay, can't wait to get to the website and see that. <laughs> We're going to take another break right now. We'll be back in a minute. HeritageRadioNetwork.org is dedicated to providing the most up-to-date information and news on the food industry. Interviews with chefs and in-depth pieces on food systems take listeners literally from the farm to the fork. 
Can you hear this anywhere else? Nope. Press the donate button on our website and learn how you can become a founding member and support the station. Well, welcome back. This is Dorothy Can Hamilton and Chef Story. And today our guest chef is none other than Ron Ben Israel, the master cake designer maker king. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ron, we were just uh, we were just mesmerized by how uh, complex it is to make one of these extraordinary cakes. But you've done something even more extraordinary, and you have your own show on the Food Network as Sweet Genius. And it's quite a show. Uh, and you're <laughs> into your third season. You're just taping Amazing. your third season. How did that... When did you find time to do that? How hard is it to get a TV show? Tell, tell me about that. <sighs> I'm the wrong person to talk because I didn't even seek it out. I always enjoyed, I like to be in the public eye. I get excited about my cakes. I like to talk about myself. I have an ego, which I guess every <laughs> business owner or self-employed person needs. Absolutely. Without that, we wouldn't be able to, to evolve. But I did not seek out a TV show. The Food Network approached me. Mm -hmm. uh, and they offered me a more standard show and... I said, no. I said, I'm not interested. I want something new. And I want to have the concept of inspiration. That was one, one condition. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, a lot of the instructional shows um, are losing ratings right now. I trust that they will come back because my ideal would be a show where I actually teach how to make cakes. Yes. Um, what's very popular are competitions. So I said to the network... The reality... Reality competition. Yeah. So my condition was, as I said, to do inspirational show. Mm -hmm. I want it to be funny and irreverent in a way to show the magic of desserts. Mm -hmm. And I want to give good money to people. And they agreed to all the terms. And we showed the first season, which you hosted, you hosted my premiere at the school. <laughs> it was great. Uh, and it was great because all the, my chef friends gave food so we had it was delicious right we had macaroons from Francois Payard yeah. and cookies and chocolates from Jacques Torres it yeah. was just amazing um, but the first season turned out to be very hard I mean I came out very cruel almost mm -hmm. and then the Food Network came to lunch at Le Col mm -hmm. I always bring important guests to Le Col the school's <laughs> restaurant because it's on my turf yeah and then people take care of everybody and then they're just like butter. Mm. And then the head of the network said, you know, we really would like to see more your personality. Mm -hmm. Because I gave them a tour of the school and they saw my interaction with the students. Mm -hmm. And we went to the bread kitchen, we broke mm. some bread together. So mm -hmm. then the second season became friendlier. I was able to be a little bit more myself. Mm -hmm. And I think the show found its footing. Mm -hmm. So consequently, it's all about ratings with TV. Mm -hmm. Over a million point five viewers would see the show first time then they would see it and repeat reruns that's considered a success and the network commissioned a new season the third season within a year of shooting the first one wow congratulations thank that's you amazing. but i knew nothing about behind the scenes of tv what excited me was just the opportunity and therefore i was never nervous people said weren't you nervous in front of the camera i'm too busy figuring out what needs to be done mm -hmm. Uh, you know, because they throw you into it and you have to swim. So uh, there's this whole cult of celebrity chefs now, and you've joined that. What, what's it like to be a celebrity chef? Do people stop you on the street? Yes, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I, I always carry a Sharpie. Uh -huh. And uh, I have my little, the Food Network produces little cards with my photo and the date of the show. Uh -huh. And when people stop me, I say to them, would you like to take a photo? Uh -huh. I'm a total... I love the attention mm -hmm. in the supermarket, it airport mm -hmm. security, and people are so nice. Sometimes they have a critique about the show, oh, and really? they tell me, well, this and this chef should have won, but it's very interesting because the show creates a buzz. And even if people dislike the show, I tell them, well, would you like to come on the show yourself? You know, it creates a dialogue. Ah. And I'm still so excited about learning how to do TV, there are about 60 people on the set that nobody sees. We mm -hmm. have kitchens behind it and dishwashing and producers and camera operators. Mm -hmm. There's seven cameras on the set, which you never see. 
Really? What wow. you see is so, me and the chefs. So, you know, I think the New York Times last week had a, a an article on the business of being a celebrity chef. And <laughs> um, as Bobby Flay once said to me, you know, c- cable is great because you shoot a little and they show it a lot. But mm-hmm. at, at the end of the day, you have to have something else that pays off, like his mm-hmm. restaurants. Mm-hmm. So have you, have you seen that this has been a great business decision for you and Ron Ben Israel Cakes uh, to do this show? And uh, where are you getting, uh, where are you getting business from? Is it from mm-hmm. national, international? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a loaded mixed question because it's true that people that come in are having even better fun because mm-hmm. they want to meet the, in quote, celebrity. Mm-hmm. But I have a feeling that maybe my newly acquired reputation may turn some people off in the sense that they will think that our cakes are so expensive Mm. that they can't afford it, which Mm. is not the case. My cakes proportionally cost less these days because I have the crew and the space to produce them. Ah. So it's no longer that I had to carry eggs six flights of stairs and break them myself. (laughs) So we can produce better and bigger for less. And I definitely am very careful about raising prices in the economical downturn. Uh, And it's more important for me to create a cake for uh, a couple or an occasion Maybe I'll suggest to simplify the design, Mm -hmm. but I don't want to raise the prices. So TV is a double-edged sword. One thing is when I shoot TV, I'm 100% there, but in the end, I'm so happy to return to the kitchen, Mm -hmm. which is really my base. I always want to have a production kitchen where I can make cakes. But after a while of producing cakes, it's so nice to go to the TV studio and get this, the lights, the action. (laughs) Yeah, well, you know, you're background is dancing and performance and it seems like this is a perfect marriage between the two so what's in the future for Ron Ben Israel all I would like to all I ask for is to continue having the chance to continue so exploring TV is really fascinating Mm -hmm. and working for the TV network the food network is so good because they can use me in different ways Mm -hmm. so it is a new home Um, I'm building a new bakery space Uh, we need to expand. <laughs> you need to. All right. Well, that's a good. Yeah. It, it means business as well. Yeah. yeah. And I would like to stay connected to the International Culinary Center because I need the interaction with the students and the faculty. Mm-hmm. And I always like to go back to class and continue learning. I think that, I told you yesterday I went to a demonstration by Chef Hervé about hydrocolloids, colloids, and um, new, new cuisine techniques. And what did you learn? Ah. Oh, First, I learned that my accent is nothing compared to the French chefs who teach in the school. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I learned so much about the use of hydrocolloids, different enzymes, and uh, isn't that scary? You want to explain to no most most of the additive are all natural. They come from sea algae that, of course, is purified. Instead of gelatin, there's a lot of use of um, thickeners that come from tree bark. Some of them are already used in my decorations. But it's finding new ways to present food uh, that, you know, okay, let me backtrack. Just the act of whipping egg whites to a meringue is still miraculous to me. But somebody figured it out hundreds of years ago, and now it's part of our classics. Now chefs are finding ways to whip foam, but without egg whites. Okay. And one of the advantages, if you use a small amount of this natural occurring cellulose from plants, you can make a meringue-like substance, a foam, with, let's say, passion fruit puree. So you don't dilute the flavor of the egg whites because you use the natural foaming cellulose. Uh, right, and you get the flavor, and you get something that is vegan and kosher and fat-free. Wow. So, if I could translate it to wedding cakes, that will be the new course at the International <laughs> Colony Center. <laughs> but it's very important for me to be able to continue learning. Uh-huh. So, I went yesterday for two hours in the afternoon, sat among the students, and learned new things. Mm-hmm. And that, was, that totally revived me, that, because well, now I have new challenges. No. That's, that's fascinating. So, do you, do you do vegan cakes, by the way? I don't, and I'll tell you why. And I don't think I will really, because the inside of the cake could be vegan. But all my decorations are based on, as Chef Jacques Torres says, sugar. (laughs) (laughs) And sugar is my medium for decoration. Mm -hmm. So what I suggest to couples, if the couple is vegan, Mm -hmm. uh, 
we'll get a vegan cake from a colleague of mine to mm-hmm. serve the mm-hmm. couple. Mm-hmm. But let us do a good butter-laden, egg-rich, <laughs> Belgian chocolate, sugary <laughs> confection. And the, the cakes that we do, that the whole cake will uh, serve a dietary reason is gluten-free. Mm-hmm. because we found a good flour that can replace, and it's a growing problem, the gluten. Mm-hmm. And we can do kosher, meaning non-dairy, mm-hmm. with certifi- uh, rabbinical certification. Mm-hmm. But a vegan cake by itself will be sugar-free, and then... Yeah, it, that's not a cake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's so many wonderful bakers around in New York City. That can do vegan. And I can recommend. Oh, good. Uh, before we close, you... One of the things that struck me that you said today was that you wanted your TV show to be inspirational. Uh, many people just want it to be entertaining or make them look good, but you wanted it to be in- inspirational. The other thing is you, you are an incredibly talented and beloved <laughs> teacher. What, what words of wisdom do you have for people out there that are passionate about cooks uh, cakes and mm. want to cook do you have some words of wisdom for them and to pursue their passion well the first would be of course practice 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 get the information get good information so invest in classes private classes a good group classes and then practice but I think one reason I was able to stay in business is I don't take it for granted and it's not necessarily for me to talk about passion or art in quotes but I like to do things. So for me, when I get to the kitchen and I work with the batter and the butter, I get happy because I get a chance to do it. If I thought about the final result, uh, let's say celebrity status, that does not work because it's external. I have to think about the, the craft, the metier, as we say in school. Uh, once you see Chef Papin butchering, or Chef Sayak introduce a new dish, then, then you know that this is what I want. I want to be able to continue enjoy, continuously enjoy the craft. That is spoken yeah. like a master. Uh. Thank you very much for coming on the show today. And um, I hope you've inspired many, many more young pastry chefs to practice, practice, practice. Uh, I also want to thank Jack Inslee, our producer, And a shout out to our assistant producers, Heidi Tickle and Joe Sevier. And see you next time. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.